Hey guys, Stockaholics, thank you guys for being here today. What the heck is going on in dry bulk? Today I listened to a few conference calls for some dry bulk companies. I kind of wanted to share some of the bigger picture ideas that they've been talking about, get some macro ideas. I'll also be sharing some ideas in the form of graphs from some people I follow on Twitter. And then I also wanted to look a little bit at this uh, idea surrounding U.S. inflation being the source ultimately for dry bulk rates and kind of look at what's going on with that idea too. Okay, first of all, I wanted to look at the Baltic Dry Index. This is kind of an average of all the different classes of the uh, bulkers segment, uh, the average of all the earnings that they're making at any given time. And the last year we did see it saw that there was a big spike in the bulker rates that they were earning that during that time. It coincided with a period of high inflation. There was a big drop after December that during that time. That is not unusual. You can see that that has happened many times in the past. That's because there is a, a period of seasonality in the bulker segment, much like some other shipping segments. In this period in 03-04. Baltic Dry went up into that winter season and then it crashed until uh, May, June. I think that's kind of like the typical cycle for a seasonal cycle for BDI is you, you go up into winter and then by midsummer, you uh, around there, it, cr it crashes after the winter and then by midsummer, it tends to turn around. Now, what's unusual about this time is that we had that big spike, it crashed and it looked like there was going to be kind of like that uh, secondary seasonal rebound and it turned around. And I put this orange line over here also because I think that this is an important uh, relationship to the BDI. This is the Thompson CRB Commodity Index. And what this is is a measurement of the overall commodity complex, the prices that are happening during any given time. So uh, you'll notice that this orange line measure, or it, ma it kind of matches to some extent the, the Baltic Dry Index. That's because there's a relationship as there is increasing uh, prices for commodities that tends to correlate with periods when there's higher demand than the given supply and that for the commodities. And as a result, in the, the, the bulker segment, you tend to see uh, periods of higher than average earnings for the bulkers for the, and, and you see that in the BDI. Now again, what's unusual is we've also seen that the CRB index, just like the BDI, is rolling over uh, right now. Okay, And I think what this is telling us is that we're probably into a period of disinflation. Uh, I'll show you guys a bit more on that topic a bit later in the video. But that's what's going on with the Baltic Dry Index and overall commodities right now. Okay, next chart we're looking at comes from E. Finley Richardson. I follow him on Twitter. You guys should too. He does amazing work on the uh, any shipping segment out there. So if you're interested in shipping at all and you're on Twitter, I would highly recommend following him if you are not. One of the themes that you kind of hear on these conference calls when you're listening to these bulkers, a lot of times they'll be talking about global GDP growth because when you're thinking about overall commodity demand, one of the biggest drivers of growth or increasing amounts of tightness in the bulker market is going to be demand for a lot of these commodities. Okay, so this is a chart of 2021, 22, 22 E. Look, a slower recovery post pandemic than we would have expected, but iron ore is still the main driver of growth. Now, when we're thinking about most commodity demand out there, at least in terms of uh, the seaborne trade, a lot of commodity demand goes to China. And one of the biggest importers in the world of iron ore is China. So the projections on this chart he has here is that iron ore has been going up throughout the year. I think one of the reasons for that is because we've actually seen steel production in China at about the same levels of last year. So in order to, de uh, they're depleting those iron ore inventories, I'm assuming. And so eventually you're going to need to replace those iron ore uh, to make more steel. Now, what's what I find interesting about that is that you know one of those narratives out there is that China's in this uh, big housing bubble, and it's true <laughs> they definitely are in a housing bubble, uh, collapsing housing bubble. But when you think about one of the biggest components for a lot of these you know high rise types of buildings out there, it, that would be steel and your iron ore. And so it's find it find it really interesting that even a year into this housing collapse that iron ore demand uh, still seems pretty robust. Uh, we also know that the Chinese are about to go on a uh, stimulus program where they're going to be spending a lot of money towards uh, 
uh, infrastructure. So that's probably why that there's some uh, increasing amounts of iron, demore, iron ore demand projected in the next few years. Now, there's also some interesting patterns that I've heard from some of these uh, these uh, um, conference calls with these these bulker companies. You also hear interesting th things happening with coal. Uh, if you guys don't know, the prices for coal right now are absolutely parabolic. We are in an overall energy crisis around the world. You can see that if you look at any any energy related commodity. But one of the interesting things is that. Uh, Europe, much like I mentioned in a lot of my tanker videos, Europe is imposing a coal ban <laughs> to themselves from Russia. And so a lot of this coal might have been imported by land to uh, Europe. And instead, uh, that's not stopping Russia from uh, exporting their coal. Instead, they're, they're, it's creating some new uh, trade routes in the seas where a lot of that coal is going to places like India. Now, that doesn't suddenly stop the need in Europe for coal, for a lot of that um, both industrial purposes and electricity. <laughs> but a lot of that coal is now coming from much further away places like Australia, when it otherwise would have just come from right next door. So that's creating some slight increases in ton mile demand overall. But again, I think Europe is important to the overall picture, but I think when you're really talking about bulkers, you're really at the end of the day, you're talking about China, 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 because China is just such a huge importer of all of that overall uh, commodity index uh, complex. Last thing he's got on this chart here is negative on his chart, which is grains. I think that's because be just like the, there's increased demand for uh, seaborne demand of coal, there's been a disruption with grains. So there's a lot of grain that comes from Ukraine. Ukraine's been invaded by Russia and it's really messing up that, uh, that ability to get that, that grain uh, exported from their country. So uh, I guess to kind of summarize this, uh, we're seeing increased demand, seaborne demand for things like coal in different places uh, like Europe. We're still seeing some iron ore demand uh, and we're probably going to see that uh, those demand for those two things increasing next year um, from places like China, even though they're in kind of like this housing bubble. And all, at the end of the day, there's much smaller segments uh, of, of total ton mile demand, like grains, is also heavily being impacted by that war over there. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this, iron ore coal, in my opinion, are some of the most important commodities to the overall bulker trade, like 30% and 30%. So if you really wanted to simplify it, and this is kind of how I do it in my brain, I really just try and focus on the demand for these two commodities. It's another quick chart from uh, Mr. Richardson. I wanted to show you guys this. This is Chinese GDP growth and forecasts. Uh, I guess this is according to the IMF and some of their assumptions. I wanted to show you guys this because I think this is a very interesting pattern, which you may recognize when I show you guys some other charts in a second. Um, but in 2020, they had the uh, medical event around the world. Uh, they locked a lot of things down around the world and everybody had this very poor period of GDP growth. China, one of those places too. Now you saw a sharp uh, synchronized reflation period of, of economic growth in 2021. And then it looks like today we may be also going through this other uh, small down period as well. Uh, I think the, the this is really a big bullwhip effect. I think I've mentioned this in some of my other videos. And uh, that's because you went through this period of you know, underproduction and then a period of overproduction based on U.S. stimulus. Now we're entering an, a period of underproduction, probably because a lot of Americans who are the biggest trade partner in China are uh, not buying as many things, not as many dollars are getting over there. It's impacting the Chinese economy in some ways. So you're seeing a period of slower growth. And then the IMF is projecting that their, their growth is going to have another smaller reflation period here. So if this chart is correct, I would imagine on that BDI, you, you would see another sharp uh, period uh, next year. Okay. I think what really drives if we're you know if we can look at all these trees in the forest we can look at china which is actually probably the biggest tree in the forest by the way but there is still that whole forest out there in terms of overall commodity demand i think what ultimately is basically the soil in the entire forest is 
the United States. Now, the United States is the biggest trading partner in China. Actually, if we go back to this period over here, this period in 2003 till 2006, seven, where Chinese, where their economy was growing at these double digit rates, that coincides with a period in the United States when we had a lot of monetary expansion and expansion happening during the time. Now, because the United States has that global reserve currency, when they spent a lot of money, a lot of that is going to escape the United States. And it, I think it goes and it basically adds fertilizer into that, that global forest. It creates all kinds of demand globally for all kinds of commodities. And a lot of that ultimately gets reflected in that Baltic dry index. You know, when we think about what this, this last spike that we had in 2021, there was a big spike in BDI, even though the Chinese were very clearly at the their terminal stages of their housing market also. You know, maybe there's a slight lag. Uh, maybe that's what we're seeing now in the overall market. But, you know, maybe that biggest tree in that forest is maybe hurting a little bit, but that there's that fertilizer, I think, that is ultimately going to come and feed this whole forest. And that is that uh, U.S. dollar creation. Now, this is a chart of loans and leases and bank credit for all commercial banks. Again, this is a proxy for figuring out how much dollars are being created through traditional means in the U.S. economy. And I wanted to make a point of this 70s over here, too. Recently, I made a video where this coincides a lot with boomer demographics and them entering how home aged years. When they do this, they get a loan. And when they get loans, they create new dollars into the system. And so there's these periods of very sharp inflation in the 70s. Now, this coincided with a period before the 70s where there was a long term underinvestment in commodities. We also saw this after the 70s when, by, by the way, quickly in the 70s, there was probably an underinvestment in commodities that coincided with this period of high dollar growth. So because this dollar uh, creates, if you have increasing amounts of dollars, increasing inflation, it increases the demand for commodities. When you pair that with an undersupply, it shoots the prices of commodities up, right? So when we look, we think back to that CRB index, as the prices of commodities move up, so does the Baltic dry, right? Okay. Now, after the 70s, there was a big period of underinvestment in commodities. Lots of supply shocks happening in the 70s. Lots of high uh, commodity prices led to a lot of investment. And then basically, even though we kind of had moderate dollar creation, not at the same rates that we did in the 70s, we still had this moderate dollar creation in the 80s. It wasn't so bad in terms of inflation because we had a lot of supply coming online. During that time, there was that uh, President, Mr. Ronald Reagan, and he's famous for this, you know, this idea of supply side um, economics where, OK, you know, demand is one side of the equation. But if we can increase the supply of, you know, goods, commodities, services, whatever, then that's going to lower inflation. I don't really think that he had too much to do with that, to be honest, <laughs> but he's kind of credited for it. Uh, I think really what drove that overinvestment and then that subsequent bear market in commodities and uh, ship and uh, commodity shipping after was this big period of investment and these supply shocks during the 70s. Okay, And so you saw these two decades of very low commodity prices. In the 2000s, from 2003 to 2008, we had that period of uh, high dollar creation again. You can see that it's kind of above this line. By the way, this is the percent change from a year ago. So if it's it can stay as high at these higher elevations, that's telling you that there's a lot of dollars in a short window being created, right? And these there was a lot of dollars being created at this time, which was also paired with a uh, after a long period of underinvestment in commodities. So if you look at all kinds of commodities, all kinds of shipping segments in the 2000s, there was um, you know, they they did great, <laughs> but I think what ultimately caused that was this fertilizer, which caused this growth that was kind of exceeding the the available supply of you know the the ships and commodities out there, and then we had the global financial crisis in the United States, and you know we can really see that that's where this Chinese GDP ultimately started crashing afterwards. Now I'm sure there's probably some demographics, some things like that also involved here. But if we continue to see high rates of um, United States dollar growth, I wouldn't be surprised if we reach some 
higher levels of consistent GDP growth in China and some other places in the world like India, which is rapidly growing and also has high commodity demand also. Now again, in the late 2000s, uh, uh, we, 2008 until basically today, We've seen that there is another period similar to the 80s and 90s where we've seen that there is a uh, period of underinvestment in commodities and we are again entering a period of high dollar creation. Now this original spike here was that spike that was also measured in the Baltic Dry Index. This spike is was government driven. So it's been different than any of the other inflationary periods on this chart. Now, it's a little bit deceptive because you would think that this negative period here is uh, is is disinflate, highly disinflationary. We can see that it is becoming somewhat disinflationary, but none of this these dollars were destroyed. And during this period, you had a slight period of deflation. You had lower cre money creation going on. This period here, actually, maybe if I can show you guys this in terms of just billions of dollars instead of this chart. <laughs> Uh, let's let's actually go do that real quick. Let's go to the original chart. I don't know why I just didn't show you guys this instead of a picture of it. But you can see if we look at it in terms of this, uh, in terms of billions of dollars instead of percent change, we are again entering a period of traditional bank driven inflation in the United States. And this isn't the same kind as the stimulus period here. None of these stimulus dollars were destroyed, much like those dollars were destroyed over here. We're not seeing any kinds of defaults. A lot of this was just pure monetization through things that of loans that did not even need to be repaid. But since June of last year, we're going through a period of rapid loan growth. So this is telling us that the, eventually this is going to be reflected in the system. And I think that this is ultimately going to drive more demand. It's going to ultimately stimulate Chinese uh, growth. And because it will stimulate Chinese growth, it, this is this effect is slower than that stimulus effect. It takes a year or two. Check out my, my recent video if you're curious on that. But ultimately, I think it's going to stimulate that growth maybe in the next couple of months, maybe six months, 12 months at the most is what I think. I think that eventually you're going to see that Baltic Dry Index turn right around. Okay, last thing, you know, probably I should have started with this in the first place, but I think really when we're thinking about any kind of a, a cyclical sort of investment, we want to see that supply is still really low when we're getting in. Now, I've been in dry bulk for, I don't know, several, six months. Uh, at the beginning of this year, I started purchasing uh, dry bulk companies, um, especially when they had that pullback in the beginning of the year. But what is most important, I think, in any cyclical is that supply is very low. And what's interesting about dry bulk is that uh, unlike, you know, what we saw with the tankers right away in 2020, they had they had a period of very brief high earnings and they went out and they bought a, bu a bunch of ships. Not a lot of ships, but they, it was still something. The container ships out there, they had a period of amazing earnings, basically because of some unique conditions, again, because of US stimulus, I think. And they they've they're, they bought a lot of ships, and even today they're buying a ton of ships. LNG, they've been doing awesome. They've been buying a lot of ships too. And so dry bulk was kind of like the last mover in this, this last couple of years. And even though they had that big spike, they weren't able really to go and buy ships because by the time they had their little you know moment in the sun, the <laughs> everybody else had kind of filled up these these shipyards with uh with all kinds of other vessels so what i really like about dry bulk segment right now is that they're kind of stuck they're in this hard place where they've just had a lot of earnings they're kind of cleaning up their balance sheet some of them are returning their money to shareholders and at the same time much like the tankers today they're in this hard place where they it's really hard for them to order ships and it'll be some time even if they do where they're going to have some kind of meaningful supply response so really this is one of the biggest indicators for me i made a recent video on three indicators on when to sell a shipping company too this is a basically when i look at this chart when i look at the dry bulk order book overall just they're at a historic low in terms of fleet percentage it's, it's another sign that says, hey, it's another great buying opportunity, in my opinion. Not investment advice, too, by the way. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Maybe this video is a little bit all over the place. 
Hopefully you guys found something uh, useful in the ideas and commentary. Uh, dry bulk is probably not my strongest space out there. When I'm thinking about all of these commodities and how they interact with this shipping segment, for me personally, I find it like a lot more challenging than I do just thinking about the oil tankers. So if you think there's something I got wrong, I'd be curious to hear in the comments below. But anyway, I hope you guys have a great day and I'll see you guys soon.